Welcome to our fourth protocol working group call, believe it or not. And we're going to be recording it and posting it later. Uh, so just everything is going to be public. Uh, very excited to kick off this call. Just on the agenda today, we're going to do an update on developer governance, uh, do some introductions as we have a few people joining us, and then we'll get into the main discussion. We have two NEPs, uh, 399 flat storage and 455 parameter compute costs. There are links to those NEPs on the invite in case you want to look more closely. And then we will open it up to Q&A and talk about next steps and how to get involved. So just a quick update on uh, developer governance. So over the last few months, we've been engaging with the community over this initiative, which is really about bringing people and organizations together to help build a decentralized developer ecosystem and empowering anyone to contribute from idea to code. And we've been bucketing most of the developer community activities into four areas. So ideation, implementation, review, and support. And I just wanted to quickly highlight them to help contextualize our meeting for today. So starting with ideation, this is about sharing and exploring ideas with other people in the ecosystem. So anyone can submit an idea, like improving the protocol or standards. And it's important to have a place for people to freely express and explore themselves and explore ideas um, in a welcoming and permissionless way. And one way to do that is in the developer governance gigs board. And this is a new uh, platform on Near Social for anyone to share their ideas, to get feedback and support from the community. And it's still in the early days, but uh, there's already a lot of activity on there and anyone who's interested uh, can start posting their idea today. Now, maybe you have an early seed for an idea or a topic that you wanna explore with others. So another great way to get involved is to join a community group. And community group is a group of very passionate, self-organized people who are interested in a specific topic, such as zero knowledge, wallet standards, et cetera. And they offer a great opportunity for people to come together uh, and just discuss ideas and, and concerns and things they want to uh, help improve. And many of these groups have already formed uh, and have dedicated communication channels like Telegram, as well as regular meetings. And you're welcome to join any of those groups or to start one yourself. You can find them on the developer governance website. And we're also going to be publishing a blog post probably this week that will highlight some recent learnings and insights from a lot of these groups. So what happened if you already have submitted an idea and now you want to turn it into code? This is where implementation comes in. You can also use the DevGov gigs board to submit implementation solutions to your ideas. Or even if you have an alternative solution in mind for somebody else's idea, you can propose that as well. And this is just a great way to gauge community interest and support and to get a variety of perspectives, which really can help strengthen our collective uh, problem solving and innovation. Now, if you have an idea that you want to get integrated across the ecosystem, like a new contract standards or protocol improvement, or if you are seeking funding support, you will need to get a more official validation from a recognized group of experts. And you can do that by submitting an app, a near enhancement proposal. And this is a rigorous process that is similar to other prominent open source projects like Rust, and it enables anyone to submit their proposals for review. And you know this is actually what we're talking about today on a call, as an app that was submitted. So what happens once you submit an app and how does it move uh, forward? So this is where the review comes in, which involves working groups like the wallet uh, standards working group that we have here today. And basically a working group is a selected committee of subject matter experts that help review proposals in a thoroughly and timely manner and oversee decisions. And there are multiple working groups, each one focusing on a different ecosystem need. We've already kicked off four of them to help bootstrap this process. And we've been iterating on it for the last few months to kind of understand what works and what doesn't. And we hope to introduce more groups in the future and empower uh, more people in the community to, to run them. So before we get into the actual call today, I just wanted to highlight the roles that are involved in the NEP process, as well as the, the stages. So uh, on the roles front, we have the author. This is the person who writes the proposal and presents it to the working group. There can also be a champion who takes that over in case the original author is unable to uh, continue. 
there's the moderator, the person who facilitates the process and helps validates that the proposal meets the guidelines and progresses forward. There's the reviewer, the subject matter expert, the person who reviews the technical feasibility of the proposal, and then the approver. This is the working group member uh, who helped make the final decision. And in terms of the actual illustration of this process, there are three stages, draft, review, and voting, and two outcomes, approved and rejected. And all of those roles help move the NEPs through these stages and towards the outcomes. And most of this happens asynchronously on, on GitHub, on the NEP itself. But when we do get to the voting stage, each working group has a public meeting, like the one we're having today, to discuss the NEP with the author and to formalize the decision. And this is what I meant to show when I was talking about that. We're here to, to vote and have make a decision. All right, so uh, lastly, I just wanted to highlight what happens when an app actually gets approved uh, and how can the implementer seek funding. And that leads us to the last area, which is support. <laughs> so once the working group completes their technical due diligence and approves their proposal, uh, they can use the developer governance gigs board to post an official attestation. And this tells any potential sponsors that there was a formal review done by recognized experts in the ecosystem and that any organizations or individuals can choose to sponsor that project. So that was a very quick uh, overview of the latest parts of developer governance. And as I mentioned, there, there are more blog posts coming that will help kind of go into further detail. And you can already check uh, one that, that explains it uh, on the developer governance website. And with that, I am super excited to jump into the call today. And I'd like to do some introductions. Uh, and start with the working group members. So, Bowen, I will hand it over to you to introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. Uh, Bowen, head of protocol at Pagoda. Uh, yeah, excited to uh, discuss this to uh, newly submitted APs. Uh, Marcelo, do you want to go next? Yes, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Marcelo. I've been involved uh, with a uh, new community for a long time. Uh, at early days, I was a member of the core development team, and after that, I was working uh, at Aurora. Right now, I'm supporting the ecosystem mostly by uh, helping move forward protocol, uh, like maps related to the protocol. Uh, yeah, happy to help here. Hi, I'm Martin. I'm a tech lead for the protocol, and yes, very excited to get two additional maps and awesome improvements to the protocol. So let's see. Nice. And I also wanted to represent Alex, who's technically a part of the working group as well, but uh, was not able to make it. But that's okay, because we need basically two third uh, majority and look, we have we have enough participants. So that's that's great. All right, next, I'd love to introduce the NEP moderators that were involved, uh, starting with Vlad. Hey, everybody. Vlad's here. You can find me um, where it's media says uh, as a handle troll. And uh, I joined here four years ago, and uh, now I'm happy to help to facilitate the uh, developer governance needs and uh, uh, orchestrate all the working groups and um, uh, empower our community together with Ori and Max. Um, Ori, back to you. Hello again. Yes, and very excited to to continue to to bootstrap and iterate. So. Yeah, now I'd like to hand it over to uh, the various authors that were involved with these two NEPs. And I, I think we have Alex on the call. Yeah, sure. So, hey, my name is Alex. I work in the core protocol team in Pagoda. And the last year I was involved into various projects related to storage and uh, yeah, for stor the storage. And uh, here um, I will represent the NEP 399, which we wrote with the meme. It's not here. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to participate in this discussion. Nice. Yeah, and I, th I think we have basically, there are two authors for each one of the NEPs, and we have one author representing. So the other one is uh, Jacob. Yep. Hi, my name is Jacob. I'm an engineer at the runtime team at Pagoda. Been hacking around on your protocol for a bit over a year now. Um, yeah, and Andre is also in my team. I uh, joined a few months ago. 
he did most of the work here. I kind of gave the initial input and that was already stolen from other engineers, the idea itself. So really this is kind of a teamwork that we are now presenting here. Um, and I'm today mostly representing Andre's work. Very cool. Well, thank you for, for all the work that all of you have invested into these NEPs and uh, we're very excited to, to finally uh, get to a decision stage. So yeah, I just wanted to also call out that if anyone has any questions at any point, feel free to use whatever Zoom features you like that are on this call to, to communicate. We'd love to hear your thoughts as we go along or questions and we'll make sure to address them or get to them also at the end if we need to. All right, so let's get to the main part, the discussion of the NEPs. And we're just gonna go uh, you know, through NEP number, like the first one and talk through it, make a decision, and then we'll move on to the other one. So let's go ahead in sequential order, starting with NEP 399, flat storage. And I would love to invite Alex to uh, give a high level summary of the NEP and why it's important. And, and then we'll go into the, the benefits and concerns on the next slides. So. Hey again, Alex. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to present that. So in this introduction, I assume that you like, already know what uh, like a blockchain state is. And uh, to say it, I like at first I say like why, um, like what is this issue we're trying to solve? Like our state is currently a prefix three or a try. And uh, for scope of this call, it means that uh, to get a single key value pair, you need uh, to iterate over uh, these try nodes from the root to the leaf node. And uh, in total, that there can be many nodes, like in theory, up to key length multiplied by two. In practice, like we see numbers around like 10 or 20. And the biggest problem is that uh, these are random reads and there is simply no way to like make these reads not random. So, and I consider this as a performance issue. So now instead of just a single storage read, you need to do like around let's say 10 reads. And uh, here for storage comes. So the plan is to replace these 10 reads with one read. And this is simply resolved by storing like a flattened key value mapping. So instead of looking into try, into try you need to just look into the mapping. And uh, so one thing is performance reasons. Another is related to gas. Like gas is a uh, like major pain, uh, pain point for some of the developers. And one of the uh, problems is uh, um, half predictability of the costs. And uh, it's worth noting that uh, we currently have so called cost touching try node, which is also listed in the NEP. And this is simply the cost of touching a single node. And uh, this cost makes sense. We need to have it, at least for now, because reading each node is some work. But uh, currently, this cost is really hard to predict as well, because it really depends on the tree shape. So some product developers could be really confused by the cost changing. And so they will have challenges figuring out these costs. So instead of that, we will just charge them from, for uh, one read, which is an obvious benefit. So that's it. Yeah. And uh, to sum up for storage, uh, aims to improve performance of reads and also improve the predictability of fees for storage reads. Awesome. Thank you, Alex, for that overview. And yeah, as I mentioned, there was a lot of, I think, discussion uh, on the NEP itself. We got, you know, subject matter experts who, who reviewed it, as well as the working group members. And I'd love to invite uh, one of the work group members to summarize some of the benefits and concerns that were raised during those discussions. Could I can represent it. I can, oh, I can talk about it here. Thank you. Right. The TLDR is like flat storage gives us like a secondary index over our data. So as Alex was saying, try structures optimized for 
an easy way to verify the correctness, but not necessarily performance. And flat storage is kind of the opposite, right? Here we're talking about efficient access and more deterministic access. Uh, this helps both with, as I said, with the estimation of the gas cost, but that's like a small fraction. The bigger fraction is it basically improves overall performance, especially for larger contracts that have deeper tries. Moreover, having such secondary index will allow us to do further optimizations in the system in the future. Because suddenly we can do things like getting the current, like suddenly getting the current state of the account is a cheap operation. Or is it just a linear scan over kind of scan over the data rather than a bunch of random lookups that we had in the try? So these three, these three things combined means that, yeah, Blastor has a bunch of cool benefits. But next slide, please. Usually, when there are benefits, there are also some concerns. The big concern here is that it's not easy. Flat storage adds not only implementation complexity, but it, it's, it also introduces a, a bunch of small risks because suddenly we have two copies of the same data. There's always a problem if something goes wrong, you know, uh, you might not know which one, which one is, the, is the correct one. Uh, it also increases, as this is, these are two copies, also increases the storage requirements for the nodes and memory requirements. Because for, uh, these are more technical details, but in order to efficiently do these operations, we do have to store more data. We have to store things called deltas in the, in the memory in order to be able to handle forks in a proper way. Um, this, this part that we that is proposed in the SNAP is actually slowing down all bit the read, read, modify write workload, but because this is just a part of the longer plan. The hope is that the future NAPs will actually then drastically improve the read modify right. But again, we didn't, I mean, the, the, the team didn't want to combine too many things in one, in one request because it would be like very complex. So you can think about this SNAP, this flat storage as the first step in around three to four step process that would really bring us a lot of benefits when it comes to this access performance. Awesome. And next slide, I have no idea what's on the next slide, but let's do the next slide. Yeah, well, the next, the next slide is uh, now we're actually coming to the decision. So I'd love to hear from each working group member their opinion and uh, how they're leaning and uh, yeah, basically get to the voting stage. So who wants to go? Uh, yeah, as, as I uh, mentioned on GitHub, uh, I lean towards approving this uh, um, NAP. Uh, yeah, I, I think as Martin already summarized, uh, it uh, greatly helped uh, improving the storage uh, read performance. And also uh, there are other benefits like making the cost more predictable and making other things related to storage easier to do. Um, yeah, I mean, there are some downsides, especially with implementation complexity and also um, potentially uh, effect on the right performance. But I think, yeah, those are uh, already taken into consideration. And then we have uh, ideas on how to address them in the future. Okay, I can chime in now. So, uh, in general, uh, this being this is a topic that it's been discussed for a really long time now. Um, we kind of, I think, we already understand uh, pros and cons. Uh, one thing I, I really like about this proposal that it, it's kind of what Martin was mentioning in the in the cons is that all this complexity, it's actually how you need to implement it, which, which of course we need to implement it in some way. But the nice part is that it's not part of the protocol, uh, as opposed to, for example, the Merkle tree, where we need to have a really nice spec, a really well spec about how the Merkle tree should be accessed and how the cost should be uh, managed. Uh, these flood storage can allow other clients to implement it in a different way, potentially a different way. Uh, so that's uh, also a benefit. So potentially the, the code can be simplified. Uh, and yes, uh, in general, I'm also uh, leaning towards approving uh, this NEP. Awesome. Uh, I guess, Marcin, did you want to, I think you kind of already spoke, but is, do you want to say your indication? 
Yes, I am consistent with what I said five minutes ago. Yes, I, I, I also lean towards approving this now. Cool. Just to be super explicit, yes. So it sounds like we have a full majority uh, vote to, to approve this NEP. So awesome. Congrats. And I think we can now briefly talk about what does that mean in terms of the next step? So yeah, what, what, what are the, the next steps that we need to outline here for this NEP? Alex, maybe you have some insights on there because I, I, I just uh, tried to learn the status there uh, and it seems like the implementation is already uh, merged a long time ago and it was very well tested on staging, but can you speak to it maybe in more detail? Yes, sure. Uh, so implementation is uh, well tested. The stabilization uh, PR is not ready yet, but uh, it will be ready soon. We were mostly like applying testing by maintaining cloud storage at the same time. We tried not being part of the protocol, but consistently like checking correctness of cloud storage and checks were passed. So as for uh, other important point is that the cloud storage kind of relies on the next step we want to discuss because the next step addresses some of security concerns with the storage opportunity links. And as for next steps, I also can mention that like there are other ideas. Like, uh, how soon we will we implement that depends on like the like, like company goals. But uh, like to be transparent, I say that one of the ideas is uh, applying it to state sync, meaning that uh, food storage would allow to sync um, to create the state to get the state from other nodes faster. Then you can't please. Another idea is to apply the same optimization to rights, but this is uh, on the research stage. That's two major uh, big steps coming to my mind. Uh, one question for you, Alex, with regard to the overall testing you have done. Have you tried to migrate to flood storage in mainnet, like in the testing framework? So do you know how much time will it take approximately? Yeah, we know how much time the migration takes. So it's uh, like, let's say uh, 10 hours for the PC nodes on mainnet, 15 hours for the centered PC nodes, and two hours for, uh, sorry, two days for archival nodes. I see. And uh, like the complexity is key because to create flood storage, we actually have to iterate the whole try, which is slow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we are well prepared for that change. Okay. Awesome. Any other questions? That does mean that the validators node will need to have like two nodes and swap between them uh, to, in order to, say, to, to apply the migration and then right. proceed execution or is it happening in the, in the background? Awesome question. Um, that's what we cared about a lot. And you don't have to stop your node, actually. The migration can happen in the ground. The only like requirements we have is that like you need to um, have a new binary, let's say a week before the actual protocol upgrade happens. The thing is that like when, when protocol upgrade happens, then you need to have that storage. But we usually give at least a week for the latest upgrade. And in that sense, it's just enough to download the binary, launch it, and they will be fine automatically. Awesome, thank you. I, I will also mention that still immigration is quite heavy work. So like it's, again, like a bit more details. It's eight Ryan threads, like constantly reading data from B. And if it takes a lot of time, like there is a config option to increase number of the threads. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Thank you. Are we ready to move to the next step? Yeah. Then? Yeah. We'll Sorry. follow up async on, on the next steps. And uh, yeah, for now, let's move on to NEP 455. Uh, and I'd love to invite Jacob to speak to it. Yes. So 
basically this snap is about a problem that is mostly for protocol engineers that users may not care that much about um that is at least my impression here so let's take a step back and think about what gas is and why this can be a problem for protocol engineers so developers have to attach specific amounts of gas when they make a function call and when they make it from within a function call they make another function call we call it a cross contract call and they have to be quite precise in how much gas they attach there if they get the estimation wrong things will fail and that it can be quite problematic and in like in the worst case it's a security flaw uh, where a user can enforce that part of the execution fails while other parts work and when people upload their code to the blockchain and the contract is installed these numbers how much gas is attached is fixed uh, we have some new tools that can make it relative but to some degree it's always fixed and you can't change it anymore afterwards you can just attach more in total but each of these function calls needs to have some amount of gas attached now what we have to do as a protocol engineers sometimes is change specific gas values when we do that all these estimations from contract de developers would kind of fall apart and their stuff starts failing we really don't want to do that and it's kind of our assumption that we can't break um, anything so in other words we can't change any parameters unless we can prove that nothing will be broken by it and that sometimes involves going out and finding all the developers making sure they upgrade their code and only then we can change these values so why do we even need to change these values well that's because we fill our blocks or to be more precise our chunks we fill them based on how much gas each function call or other receipt um, burns we take this as a proxy for how long it um, uh, how much time it takes to execute it and we use it to guarantee that we can finish each chunk processing within a second so that we can have our block time consistently among all shards sometimes we change an implementation and that makes a certain part slower um, it can even be that on average you make things faster but there's weird cases where something else gets slower and then we kind of have to change these parameters sometimes we find that our implementation has weird corner cases where it's slower than we originally anticipated and that leads to undercharging attacks which could be a whole topic to go into I want to avoid it here it's all written out kind of in the in the nap itself but that is the motivation right like we find undercharging problems we have to adjust it compute costs pretty simple we just say we don't fill chunks by the amount of gas but by some other number that other number we can change while keeping the gas number the same so the gas number is what people care like the developers care about that's what they estimated and if we don't touch that nothing will break but we will touch the compute cost as to how much we'll fill into the the chunk and that allows us to fight undercharging it allows us to change these estimations for how long it takes to do different things it also allows us to do faster iteration on new features try them out um, and the flat storage map that we've just approved is one of these examples where we need to change a couple of parameters where like read modify um, flow becomes slower but in most cases it's better but to be on the safe side like we, we have to in increase the cost of certain parameters again we don't want to break stuff so compute costs helps us to change the parameters we care about in terms of chunk filling without breaking anything um, and that is pretty much what we are trying to do here in terms of implementation you can just think of each gas parameter that we have today it's like a list of close to like a hundred different small parameters of that we can charge 
we kind of duplicate those and say we have a gas number and we have a compute cost number. And by default, these are the same, but we can decide specifically to change some of the, the, the compute costs when we need it. And that allows us to fix undercharging issues quickly. It allows us to um, have the situations of like flat storage can ship it without the fear of breaking anything. And yeah, they, there's a whole bunch of a space of other solutions we considered. It's all in the NAP. And there is also a whole bunch of specific details. What does it mean exactly? Where is which of these numbers used? Again, everything is in the NAP. So I will kind of close it here and answer any questions if you have them. Cool. Thank you, Jacob. That was a really great summary uh, and really helped paint a good picture. Yeah, and I think just uh, like we did for the other one, I guess if anyone is able to sort of highly speak, if there's anything else to add to the to the benefits and concerns that were raised. So anyone from the working group? Uh, yeah, let me try to enumerate this. Um, so uh, major benefit I see from this uh, uh, from this proposal is that it allows to uh, make protocol changes without breaking uh, developer experience, which is uh, which has been so far the main uh, drawback to to make this change uh, faster. At some point, at some point, this might be critical issues, as in uh, issues that bring DDoS to the system. This has happened uh, on the past. I remember with the delete action. Um, so yeah, this is a, like a uh, very neat idea to uh, get rid of this issue. We do can go to the box, like if Martin or Bowen want to elaborate there, you can go ahead, otherwise I can try to. Yeah. I mean, the TLDR I would say is like, this is the necessary evil. Yeah. I would love not to have to do it. Mm -hmm. I would love to have like a perfect estimation of gas cost and we don't have to think about having any kind of parameters. We just have one value and it's done. But because we're not living in a perfect space, that's why you have to do it. And as it was nicely written in the benefits, this is the least, like the, the simplest thing that, <laughs> the simplest thing that we can do given the time constraints. And this will definitely unblock us and give us at least a way out, a reasonable way out when we see that we have a big undercharging problem in our, in our system. Yeah, I agree on that. So one, one thing that's worth highlighting, it's why like the evil part uh, of your comment, uh, Marcin, which basically like wh why wasn't it this done uh, from the very beginning? Like well, what is the main issue that this is introducing? And basically it's like, we are kind of open about, like if you want to DDoS the system, we're kind of open about which are the methods you can call to DDoS the system cheaper, right? Uh, as we have discussed in the in the GitHub discussion, uh, it actually doesn't. Uh, uh, it, it's not a big, a very big issue. Like you might DDoS the system like twice cheaper, maybe not too much. But we need to be conscious about that, right? Like there should there shouldn't be a high disparity between gas cost and compute cost in general. And well, ideally, we want them to be the same at some point, right? As the NEP mentions, uh, the disparity should be temporary. I guess, like, I don't see this being temporary in general, but anyway, uh, it's a good idea if we uh, try to this to be the goal. Okay. Uh, do we want to get to the voting or do we want to highlight any? Other concerns? Uh, yeah, I think I think a concern number two uh, is maybe I, I wrote that. Yeah, I I, um, I think this is a good first step towards uh, addressing this problem. But I I would yeah I would like to see in the future uh, if we can do this adjustment dynamically so that uh, um, we are better equipped to deal with some of the uh, uh, emergency cases. Okay. Yeah, also, uh, I want to highlight that I was mentioning in the discussion that 
as the PR mentions, the this disparity should be temporary. In general, uh, whoever is proposing this uh, difference between compute cost and gas cost should be also making some sort of proposal or at least uh, having a, some way to track when is the gas cost be, uh, be going to be the same as the compute cost? Like which, which are the mechanisms that will be done to make this happen? And if this is not going to happen, well, let's have it explicitly somewhere. So I think this net doesn't propose a way to track those. Maybe we need to have have them as issues in in, in like in the NEP repository or in this same NEP. Um, somewhere we need to track. Like it, it's not about the disparity because the, the disparity will be like in like near reference, right? It's about how this will be addressed. That's what I mean. And maybe they can be tracking the same pull request or issue that it's creating the disparity itself. So that's also acceptable, maybe. Yeah, we can write down some specific strategy want, we want here. I, I think we want to track everything on GitHub with issues and make sure that like, as long as these are different, we have an issue that tracks that and maybe some tracking issue that summarizes all of them. Uh, but I think that's something we can kind of discuss offline as a follow-up. It shouldn't be difficult to come up with a, a useful strategy here, but definitely a good input. Thank you. Yeah, I would suggest to use the same map, just update, like create a section with the current values for now, and then submit pull requests to update it um, with like change log. We actually have this uh, uh, laid out in the uh, NEP001. As Ori already mentioned, we did a lot of changes there. And one of them is that NEPs are not set in stone and we accept the reality of the world and we, we, we will consider to add those uh, NEP extensions um, and approve them as, as a regular NEP, NEP process going forward. But I think it's the best way for, for the ecosystem to agree upon, to keep track of inside the NEP itself. But feel free to suggest some other uh, approach in the NEP. So, you know, the future readers will know how to, how to operate. Okay. Also, it might be worth mentioning that our, our, we're planning to use this net for flood storage, right? Uh, yes. So, okay. so technically it's not necessary for flood storage, mm -hmm. but based on performance measurements on our specific implementation of the client, we know that it's safer to use this the way we want, we, we plan to ship the first iteration of flat storage. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just one point that I remember from my comments that it's not enumerated in these drawbacks is the way we present this to the consumers, in this case, probably developers might be also users uh, to a less extent. Uh, but I remember while developing on Near, uh, like counting how many transactions I can batch together, like uh, in a single transaction. And I was like counting gas and all that stuff. But in this case, I will care more about compute gas than about, uh, or not, not really. No, you should only care about gas. Because the 300 teragas limit is computed using the gas cost, not the compute cost. And that's nice. all developers should care about. So this is not leaking into developers? That's what you're saying? Yes, that was our main, main priority here. And to so the question you also asked there, like in the gas profile that you can query using the JSON mm -hmm. RPC, we will just not show compute costs at all. It's just the gas numbers. Developers shouldn't even have know that this exists the only place where it's visible is if you imagine that the shard is completely full mm -hmm. right? like fully loaded then suddenly the theoretical capacity of a shard would be the say 900 teragas and not one petagas right because we would like because of these multiplications we would be like filling the shard more right? fair enough okay i see and and that has actually two implications one of them is the obvious one you limit the throughput it can get less through. And there's a more subtle one that is mentioned in the NEP, but is kind of easy to overread. 
when we adjust the gas price, we look at uh, if we are above 50% of total usage across all chunks, then we have this linear interpolation of like how much we increase it. That will also be based on compute cost, not on gas cost. Mm -hmm. So if you try to track like what is the, how does the gas price change based on usage, that will change. I don't think developers care about that, but that is an, an observable effect. Okay, fair. All right, any other thoughts or are we ready to move to voting? We can go to voting, yeah. Okay, awesome. So same drill as before, who would like to kick it off? Um, yeah, I can go first. Uh, in general, uh, as uh, Marcin put it, uh, I think this is a necessary evil. I really like that uh, way of putting this. Um, yeah, I'll lean towards uh, approving this. I think this will simplify a lot uh, of uh, process for grading uh, uh, near. Um, yeah, um, lean towards approving it. Yep, same here. We got to do what we got to do. So yes, I also approved this snap and I really thank the authors for like writing it down and you know, naps like these are not easy because we know we're kind of putting a, a little bit of a dent in our like shiny protocol, uh, but hey, uh, that's where reality meets the theory, so. Yeah, same. Yeah, I also lean towards approving the uh, the NAP. Uh, I think, yes, as Marcin and uh, Marcel already mentioned, yeah, this is uh, uh, what we need to have. Um, and uh, yeah, I am in support of that. And let's hope we will have to use it as few times as possible. Yeah. Awesome. Well, sounds like unanimous uh, consensus, so that's great. Uh, in terms of next steps, I know we already discussed making some some updates that Jacob uh, was going to take, but are there any other ones that we want to call out? I guess I can shortly comment on like the implementation is roughly ready, but it's not quite as, as far as flat storage in the sense that we've already merged the code into master because we would have to change configuration files and whatnot. We we have the PRs, but we haven't merged it yet. So kind of getting that into master room is also something we have to do, but also it's the much, much smaller change. It's like almost no change in, in terms of code, right? So that's something that's definitely needs to happen. Um, and then actually defining the numbers for like what we need for flat storage and coming up with this process, all of this is something I'm looking forward to kind of see it happen the first time. And you know. okay. I have a question to both of the uh, authors of the map. Uh, like, uh, I, if I remember correctly, there was a rush to uh, approve these two maps before the next release of Near Core going to testnet. Um, is it still on track or if the decision was reconsidered since the time, can you update uh, the community on that? You want to answer Alex or should I, or I mean, anyone? Mm, yeah, so we had actually a big discussion on that uh, yesterday. And I think the decision where that we could not rush features like even if there is uh, like upcoming release. So we better uh, like carefully like consider uh, the codes like which we are going to stabilize. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how it sounds, but I, mean, I want to take a look at the like of this snap code, like for making a decision. And uh, if, if I don't feel confident, I would not include it in the next release. So there, it's still not, uh, there, there is no final, final decision in, in regards to that. It, it's, it's still conditioned on some implementation details. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm confident in the flat storage code, but we can prepare okay. stabilization PR uh, at the release date. 
and uh, I also want to see compute cost squad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think my main takeaway here is these are two really great features, uh, and especially in combination, these are kind of something we, we want. But there's no very urgent dependency on it by anyone in the community. So there's no harm in pushing it out one release to the future. So it is kind of more relaxed for everyone. If we sure. stabilize it right after the next release is cut, then we have the full five week cycle time of like testing it before it goes to test net. And then hopefully there's just a reduced risk. I would vote for that, to be honest, but <laughs> it's your call, guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay, also to be more transparent, I feel kind of sorry for uh, like Russian uh, <laughs> this call. Uh, I think, I mean, like, ideally this uh, shouldn't happen and I, I will be like more relaxed in the future about that. All right, well, we made it. <laughs> And it seems like the working group still survived and still together with us on the call, uh, which means like we, we can keep 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 rolling. Uh, please don't drop other balls this week. Uh, we only have Friday. We don't want to do it on Friday. <laughs> no, but on, right. the, on the positive side, look, the important thing is it also shows that when needed, we can actually make sure that net process is fast enough. It's not considered yeah. like, oh no, we have to do a nap. It's going to take like five months and plus. No, it's not the case. It should be also a good signal to other developers at near ecosystem that if needed, we can move quick. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, that's actually probably a good segue uh, for Q and A. If anyone has any questions or comments, I, I do want to have a quick sidebar with the working group just to talk about a couple of. Uh, housekeeping stuff, but are there any questions related to, to the NIPs or the call that we just had? Not a Q and A, but I, I wanted to just uh, shout out to the, to the working group who were very flexible and helped us to go through the review and uh, the, um, even scheduling the, 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 the call because it's, the, the main reason why we actually take more conservative uh, and relaxed in terms of the timeline is that we are trying to accommodate the uh, all sorts of requirements of people living in different time zones and taking vacations and uh, different um, needs that all of us need. Uh, and this time was uh, really fast and snappy. And uh, thanks everybody for cooperation. Uh, thanks authors for, for the maps uh, being written in such a beautiful way and also interacting with the, all the uh, um, reviewers and getting uh, up, updates quick. Um, yeah, and uh, one thing, one extra comment, maybe more to the community that uh, we are looking for more people to contribute, to collaborate um, on behalf of the developer gardens in different roles, be it um, a contributor of the code or author of the map, um, subject matter experts, uh, um, expertise uh, required from you by the working group members looking, like all those roles are getting um, through the time. You, you can get immediately promoted to the working group member, but uh, it starts, uh, as, as all of us started with a active contribution to the code, to the ideas and uh, developer gardens now has uh, more clarity, I hope, um, with how to ideate, how to request funding, how to um, kind of contribute to the, uh, to the near ecosystem. So I want uh, to invite you to read the blog post uh, on neardevgov.org website and find all the necessary information and ask for more. Uh, yeah, and the Geek's Board is a beautiful place to um, also uh, highlight your ideas. Maybe something just you know came to your mind and you want to 
to share it with others and let them implement it uh, if you don't have time. There are all, all sorts of um, op opportunities are there and uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that was well said and I totally agree. And thank you to everyone involved. And, and it's exciting to see that we can move quickly like y'all are saying, so. Awesome. Well, we're going to follow up online on the two NIPs and excited to, to get them approved. And uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining and take care.